This is WPBS in Philadelphia, 98.9 FM, the bulletin station. We at WPBS wish to thank the Philadelphia Gas Works for their courtesy in relinquishing their time so that we can bring you, without commercial content, the upcoming special tribute to Jack Pyle. I was his severest critic and his biggest fan. In addition, I include myself as one of his better personal friends. My name is Dick Paisley, and there are those of you who listen to Jack Pyle of the former Big Band Station. You might remember my name through the inner office memos I used to write, which he in turn read on the air. Jack and I shared the same belief, and that's in the music of the big bands and the better vocals. In fact, it turned out to be unfortunate for both of us, and not everyone felt the same way. Jack Pyle was a man of principle. Some called him stubborn, others inflexible. He smoked the same brand of cigarettes, drove the same make of car, and saw the beauty of a Canadian sunset without deviation. Most of all, he loved and played good, full, big band music. I still disagree with him, however, that Bunny was the greatest. We at WPBS decided to call on Jack's pals for the night's big band wagon. The boys who worked with him during his 16 years in Philadelphia radio and television, and who are now not only in Philadelphia but throughout the country. Jack Pyle, a tribute. I can think of no better way to begin than to introduce a man who was Jack's sidekick at KYW in 1955 and early 1956, Biggie Wilson, the morning man from WNBC, New York. Thank you very much, Dick. Hi, this is Big. There's a a great joy for me in radio work, sitting around playing records, talking is the thing I like best of all, I guess. Except this is the, got to be the hardest radio show I've ever done. Jack Pyle, although he and I worked together at radio station KYW for just one year when I was in Philadelphia. I worked from 10 to 2 at night. And Jack would often pop in after his sports show on television and sit with me for a while. And then we'd always uh, go out after my program for a little steak sandwich or something, a nice glass of cold milk, and, and talk about radio. Jack had so many friends, and I don't know whether he gravitated to people or people gravitated to him, but he counted among his friends some of the the finest people. For instance, I don't have to tell you how much he loved the the big bands. Um, Among his particular favorites, the Glenn Gray Casaloma Orchestra. And one of the fellas uh, who was often seen with Jack Pyle, with whom I uh, have spent some time and have grown to admire and love as a man loves a man, is the fellow who wrote the No Name Jive, and his name is Larry Wagner. Thanks, Dick Wilson. I consider it a great honor to introduce the first number on this tribute to Jack Pyle. You know, my friendship with Jack began through No Name Jive, Glenn Gray, and the world of the Castleoma Band. It eventually came to include both working and playing together, World Series games, happy evenings spent in his home, and even trips to Hollywood with him. I always loved being with Jack. He made me feel ten feet tall, and in the case of Noni and Jive, he treated it as though I had just composed Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. All of us will remember this special gift he had for his friends, the ability to make them feel that whatever they were doing was the greatest. In music, Jack constantly maintained his high ideals, And I've always been happy that these ideals included a love for the big bands, a love which I share and which was one of the common bonds between Jack and myself. Our friendship also brought an added privilege to me, that of knowing his lovely wife, Emily, their daughter, Carol, and sons, Toby and Randy, a most wonderful family. So, Big Wilson, let's hear it for Jack Pyle. Another of Jack's favorites is a fellow who used to be uh, again on KYW and now does the all-night program at WOR in New York City. And I mentioned uh, Jack's numerous and varied uh, friends. And this fellow is uh, one of the quickest of wits, uh, a great believer in the uh, free flow, the stream of conversation that comes from whatever comes into his head, he says, and it's, it's always good. Here's Gene Shepard. I'll never forget the first time that I heard Jack 
It was uh, in Cincinnati a long time ago, not long after the war. And I had just gotten out of the Army and was coming down to that city to work and go to college at the same time. And I was listening to my car radio as I drove down through Indiana. And I heard Jack for the first time. And I instantly liked him, not only as a radio man, but I don't know, I sensed something about him that uh, I found extremely attractive. And we subsequently became very close friends. And uh, inevitably, uh, we played a part in each other's career. Uh, Jack, uh, in fact, was one of the people responsible for convincing me that I should leave the Midwest and come east to work, and I've never regretted that. But uh, professionally, I'll say this about Jack. I think I've never known a person who was more completely a radio man. Jack loved radio. He ate radio, breathed radio. He talked radio. And I have always felt that he had far more talent uh, than he ever actually allowed himself to show, ultimately. Uh, Jack, in fact, was one of those rare people who was exactly the way he was off the air as he was on the air. Uh, he could transmit his entire personality through the medium of uh, radio. Uh, he was tremendously enthusiastic in life, always. Uh, you, you just... Uh, in fact, he often tired people out just to be with him. Tremendously involved in everything he did. He enjoyed life. I doubt whether Jack uh, ever knew more than three or four brief moments in his life when he was bored. Fantastic zest for existence. Uh, and he took it as it came, too. I, I don't recall Jack doing much complaining. Uh, he was one of those guys who, uh, here it is, and this is the way it is, and he enjoyed being part of it. Just being alive was a great thing for Jack. And uh, I remember long afternoons out uh, at the ballpark watching the Phillies play. I don't think I've ever known a more totally dedicated baseball fan than Jack was. Well, I've been uh, very proud and, and certainly honored to have been allowed to say a few things about my very good and longtime friend Jack Pyle. I don't think we'll see his kind very shortly again, if ever. He was a, a product, really, of a past time and an era which is quickly disappearing. Now let's get back to Big Wilson and uh, see what some of these other people who knew Jack probably in some cases better than I did, what they had to say about my old friend. Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, when Jack uh, was at KYW, I think, back in the old days, uh, he came across a fellow named Bob Beck, and they became fast friends. I suppose uh, maybe Bob is one of Jack's closest friends. And Bob and his lovely wife, Pearl, and some fine kids and... I don't know how to explain Bob. He's a salesman. Uh, drives all around the country selling things. And he, he's kind of an ordinary, average American guy, except he's so far above average, I don't know how to tell you about it. Let's see what Bob Beck has to say. Thanks, Big. You know, Big, you weren't tagged with that name without reason. Do you remember the crazy things we did? For instance, I'd like to relate an incident which, when recalled by Jack, made him roll on the floor in laughter. It was on a hot summer night, and you decided to go for a swim in the goldfish pond in back of Jack's home? Or was it the drafty castle, as Paul Taylor called it? <laughs> well, you put on your trunks, dashed out of the living room, and plunged in with the overtones of a noisy whale. The scene was one of an erupting volcano. I suppose this wouldn't seem so funny to anyone else except to explain that you are, well, let's see, approximately six foot six, weighing at the time about 345 pounds, and the fish pond was five feet square and only four feet deep. The only resulting problem was how to get the water back out of the living room. Oh, I suppose I could go on for hours relating the genuine fun we all had in our association with Jack, both professionally and as friends. I know my wife, Pearl, and my boy, Robbie, and I had the privilege of knowing Jack for some, oh, 10 or 11 years, and we shall always cherish those memorable times together. A man who talks on radio for a living should be able to come up with some golden gems about a man like Jack Pyle. But I guess I'll just close off my portion with a phrase that he used to use. And Jack, someday... When my time comes, I'll, I'll be up there, too. And I'll be looking for you, especially. I think it's pretty well established that there was only one Jack Pyle. 
His devotion to the big bands of the swing era brought thousands of listeners to every station for which he worked. His commitment was complete and unwavering. And finally, there were few left to doubt that Jack was a sort of Pied Piper. His music was the music of a gaudy and wonderful time called the swing era. And his followers did so happily and completely. Jack called me Pops, but of course he called other people Pops too. But somehow, when he called me Pops, it was different. And I thrilled as though I'd been given a very special honor. As I said earlier, there was only one Jack Pyle. And I'm afraid that after the Lord created him, he broke the mold. There'll never be another Jack Pyle. Here is someone else who knew Jack very well. John Franklin and Jack were great friends for more years than I ever knew Jack. And I'm sure John has a very special something to say. John Franklin. Well, one of the funniest things I've uh, been able to recall about Jack Pyle over the many years I've worked with a guy was uh, the Valentine's Day present I received a couple of years ago from my kids. It was a nice little present. I loved it myself, and I uh, just couldn't wait to show it to people. And I wanted to be, I, I wanted Pyle to be one of the first uh, in town to see it. So uh, I laid for him. I set a well-planned, well-baited trap. When I went on with the farm show at 5 o'clock, an hour before Pyle was due in, I explained that uh, the kids had left my Valentine present uh, in the bedroom, and uh, I'd brought it in with me, and I was enjoying it at the moment. I would describe it for you, friends, but I just am not great at this type of thing. Jack Pyle does this sentimental, descriptive type of thing, best of anyone in Philadelphia. So if you don't mind, I'll wait till Jack gets in, let him look at it and say its value and beauty and whatnot, and he'll tell you what it is. Well, it seems that Emily heard this at about 5 o'clock when I went on the air, and she was about to get up, and she got pile out of bed that morning, dying of curiosity, just had to see what it was. Well, I couldn't blame her. It, uh, as I say, I baited the trap pretty well. I went on for an hour... Uh, I wish I could tell you what my Valentine present was, friends, but, uh, you know, I want Jack to do it. So he came in, and he's stomping, and he's walking up and down, and he says, What is it? I want to see it. Where is it? I said, Jack, wait, wait. I let him build it up on the air for about 45 minutes, and just before the 7 o'clock news, I came in and showed him my Valentine gift. I didn't have my pants on. They were a brand-new pair of shorts, white shorts, big red hearts, and they had lovely little sentimental sayings printed in the hearts. A real Valentine gift for my kids. And Jack, I think he was caught as badly as I've ever seen him caught on the air. He talked fast for about five minutes, and he didn't have nerve enough to say what the present was. He said, well, now here they are, and this guy is walking in here. No pants, just shorts. No pants, and there's the there's the Valentine gift. He said, "I understand. I want you to I, I want you to know there's nothing bad, nothing bad. But I just don't know how yet to describe this thing. Understand? It's perfectly all right." And as I say, it took him five minutes before he got <laughs> got up enough nerve to say it's a brand new pair of shorts. It's either white shorts with red hearts or red shorts with whatever the back thing would be there. And he said, "I haven't read the sentimental sayings yet, but I'll do that next and get back to you." I guess over a period of years, I introduced Pyle's morning show so many times that after a while I began to think it was mine. Of course, the reason was he was always late, never saw the guy on time. Many of us over a period of years used to say that uh, if Bunny Berrigan had lived, I guess Pyle probably would have been his closest and best friend over a long period of years. Right about here, I'd like you to meet another cat who was uh, entailed in the uh, pileisms over a period of years, and particularly of late. A guy who did many of the tapings on the Saturday night show that all of you have so faithfully listened to over a long period of time, Steve Craig. Well, thank you, Vince. I didn't uh, know Jack as long as most of you fellows did, but uh, I think it was two years or so that I did know. Uh, I can't say I got to like him, because I got to like him the first time I met him, I think, uh, here doing the Saturday Night Dance Party, engineering the program. I think 
the most I can say is what almost everyone else has been saying. I enjoyed being with the man. I enjoyed arguing with him. I think I enjoyed arguing with him more than I enjoyed anything else. I was just telling the fellas about a, a thing that happened, oh, I guess about six or seven years ago. Pyle was on a Louis Armstrong kick at the time, and he decided that it'd be a good idea to bring Louis Armstrong into this territory. So he went up to Sunnybrook, and he talked to Ray Hartenstein. And I'll bet he worked on Ray for about three months trying to get Ray to be convinced that uh, Louis Armstrong would pull in a crowd. And Ray said, no, no, never pull a crowd up here. Hasn't done it in 35 years and never will now. Well, anyway, Pyle won his point, and we went up that night. And you've never seen such a traffic jam in all your life. Well, from that night on, Paul used to make a regular thing of, of uh, calling Ray about once a week. He'd say, say, Louie's not doing anything this week. You think you'd like to have him up for the weekend? He would never let him forget it. We had a ball that night. And I guess if I went on to talk about all the nights that we were together and the many things we did... I'd use up the next four hours. It was 1950 when Pyle first came to Philadelphia. And I landed here about 1951, I guess. And I came to Philadelphia originally as the answer man. And boy, if you remember that show, you look better with a hat on, I'll tell you. But I was doing my first show for KYW. And Pyle was upstairs. And uh, he came downstairs, and I had only met him about 15 minutes before. And he decided he was going to introduce me to radio as radio should be. And there was a great big ashtray sitting on the desk. And he came over, and this answer man thing was strictly a script show. He came over, and he turned that ashtray upside down. And I didn't, I didn't waver one way or the other. I picked up the paper, and I just flicked the ashes off, you know. And he very carefully gathered them all up, put them back in the ashtray, then turned it over on my script and took his big fat hand and rubbed all the ashes in until there wasn't a word left on that page. Oh, Pops, the things I could tell about you, but I won't. There's a couple of other guys that are standing by here waiting to tell a couple of things. Bob Menefee and Joe McCauley. First, I think I'd better say this is WPBS, the Philadelphia Bulletin Station. Joe, I've heard you do a number of station breaks, but not that one before. Well, it's a little difficult to, after 24 years of doing the same station break, to uh, suddenly do a different one. Bob, I, uh, I don't know, I, I feel rather unusual, uh, our getting together on an occasion like this. I uh, instantly asked, is Bob Menefee going to be on it? And he said, of course. And uh, you had already uh, committed yourself, so... Uh, I, I wouldn't have missed this uh, under the circumstances for anything. I think uh, we were such a part of Jack's life. Do you feel as I do that uh, we didn't know Jack too well when he first became the sensation in this town? It was only when he joined WIP and had been, uh, you know, pretty well known that we got to know him well. That's right. And then, of course, uh, through the rest of his life, we counted ourselves as friends of his. I know that... Um, I have such a, a genuine, crazy feeling about file that it's, uh, it's difficult to really put it in words, and I don't know whether I'm capable of doing it. And I had uh, virtually the same feeling. It's, it's difficult to believe, make yourself uh, believe, that Jack's no longer on the scene. Uh, somehow he was so alive and so vibrant, so oh, full boy. of love of life. And, of course, the uh, one thing he has left is the music that he loved, which we're here to play. That's right. And do you think you might blubber a little bit when you hear some of these things that we associate with him? Right I now? just might. I, uh, but I, I think that would be excusable. I also had the thought that uh, one of the things that we were named down there, and Jack gave us the name. Oh, yes, he did. Was the Unholy Three. <laughs> the Unholy Three. You had the morning show then, as you do now. And I had banker's hours at the end of the day, and Jack filled in in the middle. Right. Boy, now there are... the flaming torch to me. That, that was one of the greatest lines I ever remember. And he... From failing hands... I fling. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, now, uh, I know John Fassenden, worked with him now, and have 
Worked with him since uh, the days, do you remember when I came to WIP? And John Facenda was the night editor, news editor, and I was the daytime news editor? Yes. And uh, I went out uh, at that time on many occasions with John, who never yet let anybody else pay a check. And I know that John took notice of Jack Pyle at the time he appeared on the scene in Philadelphia and said there's going to be one of the great ones. And I believe you will have to admit that Facenda had, until Jack Pyle appeared, the most distinctive voice in Philadelphia. Right. And I doubt that uh, after Pyle had been here for a few years, that I doubt that John could claim that distinction entirely because Pyle's voice was as distinctive as anybody could possibly be. I think the, the mark of success in this business is, uh, among other things, having that distinctive voice. And the two shared that, and they were friends. And John has uh, wanted to say a word here. And I think we'll just let John uh, come in here and let him introduce the next record, Joe. Why? I know there must be repetition in this tribute to a friend. There has to be. For that was the very nature of Jack Pyatt. He was the same to all people, and people reacted the same toward him. He never showed deference to one, partiality to another. His nature had a oneness which treated all alike. Warmth and genuine interest captured those he met be it for the first time or the thousandth time. He was good company, be it in a studio, a press box, a party, or just listening alone to his unique voice as it poured from the loudspeaker, a wonderfully strange mixture of molasses and polished gravel, as it was described once. Homey, yes, yet never quite, his thoughts. Knowledgeable, yet never overbearing. His enthusiasm for things he liked, and they were myriad, knew no restrictions. Yet his opinions were never so one-sided that there was no room for yours. Yes, I liked Jack Pyle. Liked the man as well as the broadcast. He had something, and he shared it with others. It was good for one to know him. My life has been enriched by having known him. I, too, am diminished by his untimely... A big sound true has been still. Yet the man who stretched his hello to six syllables to make it all encompassing has taught me how to say with respect and affection a simple goodbye. Well, we, as we said when we started out this hour, there were several people uh, behind uh, Jack Pyle in the sense that they were people... Jack had a knack of picking up people like this. I don't know... Uh, he was like a magnet in having people gravitate to him, people who were virtually unknown in this business, if not completely unknown, but who made it almost a hobby to, to help Jack. And one of them, and they call them his unpaid producers, and I understand there were a full half dozen or so, one of them is named Dick Creer, K-R-I-E-R, -E and here's Dick. I think one of the finest things that we could ever do in memory of Jack Pyle is a four-hour tribute that encompasses many of the friends that he had acquired over the years. This along with the music that he loved. Jack's pleasures were simple. He was overwhelmed with baseball, color television, veal parmesan, outdoor grills with thick hamburgers, and most of all, a group of friends in his own home. He looked forward to the many so-called summit meetings that he and his staff of unpaid producers had periodically. This, of course, was to line up the bands for future big bandwagon shows here on WPBS. My memory of such meetings and the close relationship that Jack and I had will last forever. Well, Bob, I think it's getting close to the time when we will have to fling from failing hands the flaming torch. Yes, and uh, I wish he were here to catch it. Well, I was just thinking that... Uh, should I say goodbye to Jack Pyle? No, because uh, mm -hmm. he will always mm -hmm. live in my memory. And... We can't say goodbye. To right. Him. We can just say that we hope that the friends of Jack Pyle, and they must be in the countless thousands who are listening tonight, have uh, enjoyed our reminiscing about him. I uh, believe you me, I'm glad to have these freshened in my memory. Right. This is Joel McCauley. And Bob Menefee. And we'll turn things over now to another great friend of Jack Pyle's, Bill Branson. 
This is WPBS in Philadelphia, and I'm Bill Bransom. I'm very pleased to be part of this pile package tonight, and I must admit that I'm sorry it happened under such circumstances. But I don't know, he's got a lot of his friends here tonight, and I don't suppose he'd want it any other way. A lot of good things to hear. And this is a tribute to Jack Pyle, and I'm Bill Bransom here on WPBS. You know, there's a fellow in this business, and I'm sure he's the one who got Jack Pyle to say automatically and electrically, as he always did. And here, automatically, is Paul Taylor. It's fair to say that old John Thomas was a, a phenomenon. He was a character and an eccentric in the best sense of those terms. Pyle was a great many things. He was a very simple and a very complex man. He was not educated in the customary sense of the word, and yet he had a vast amount of education. I never saw him read a book, and yet he could quote Thomas Paine and the Bible and a few other uh, standard publications, and uh, moreover, quote them with insight and understanding. It was not a repetition of words. But generally, Pyle was just Pyle. He lacked courtly, or should I say elegant, polish, and yet there was a graciousness about him, a hospitality, an innate courtesy. So what do we say then? This man was a friend. He was an honest performer. He was a liver of life. He was a human being with his frailties and his strengths. He was courageous. And he was just a, a lovable guy. Thank you, Paul. You know, Pyle's going to find out once and for all who is lead trumpet in that brass section they've got upstairs. Of course, he concluded for years it had to be Berrigan. And there are people among them, that old naval hero, T.E. Paisley, who insisted Conrad Gazzo, should have been lead trumpet. Reminds me, you know, Pyle always used to laugh at my jokes, and I gotta love him for that. I told him a story once about a trumpeter that went to heaven, and all he wanted to do was get up there and play in that brass section. And St. Peter said, well, you're gonna have to practice. And did he ever practice? He practiced for 10,000 years. Gabriel was playing the lead, incidentally. And then St. Peter said, all right, you got a chance. Get up there and let's see what you can do. And he sat down, picked up his horn, looked at his score, and he slumped at his seat. The fellow next to him said, what's the matter, Pat? Babe, Mac, whatever. He said, I've practiced for 10,000 years. And look at me, I got a 500-year rest. Uh, joining me this evening is a fellow with a real set of pipes. That's what we say in this business anyway. Fred Harper wants to come in for just a moment. It is frequently said that as long as the memory of a man lives on in the thoughts and recollections of those who knew him, that man will never die. Well, Jack Pyle is not the sort of man to evoke sentimental memories, although I guess he himself was essentially a sentimentalist. But whether those memories are sentimental or not, they are clear and they are strong. They go back for me to 1951. Jack was doing the early morning show on KYW. Gene Graves, now with WFIL, preceded him with the farm show. The horseplay between them was frequent and intense. It was on that early show that Jack and Paul Taylor began their satirical and humorous bits that later blossomed into their very popular 15-minute evening show back in 54 and 55. I remember my first meeting with Jack. He was walking some sort of a very large dog back of his apartment in Wayne. We were introduced by Gene Shepard. I remember Jack, too, when he had the top-rated record show in Philadelphia Daily on KYW from 12 noon to 3 p.m. I recall his grudging but inevitable knuckling under to the direction of Grady Edney. And then there was Jack's love of baseball, his friendship with Smokey Burgess, who came from Cincinnati to Philadelphia about the same time as Pyle, and there was his friendship with Robin Roberts. There's so much to remember, but there are many years ahead for that, for all of us. So all I'll say now is, hello, Jack. How are things where you are? I can't say it, but I am. I mean, not I am, but that's my name. That's what Jack always called me. He always wound up giving people names. 
And he called me Handsome Bill Branson. And if ever anybody says that, I'm only going to think of one guy. This is a tribute to Jack Pyle. And I'm very happy to have been a part of it. And like I said earlier, I'm kind of sorry that it hadn't happened at all. Well, thank you, Bill. Jack used to call me Rod LaRock. <laughs> that was just... Oh, a month and a half ago, although it seems infinitely longer. We were exchanging photographs. It started out as a joke, but... He would ask the folks if they wanted a picture of me to write into him. And, uh, I asked the folks who were listening to me if they'd like a picture of Jack to write to me. We kind of exchanged them. We were both surprised to, to find that a great many folks did want the pictures. And I used to... Remind them that they'd like to have a replacement for their dartboard, be sure to get a Jack Pyle picture. You get a big kick out of that. But he called me Rod LaRock after the photo in the newspaper. I'd like you to hear this story, related by the man who found himself involved with Jack. I think you'll find it very interesting. Here's the big fella from New York. This is Ed McMahon. One Saturday night last summer, I was driving down to join the family in Avalon. It was a rough night negotiating the tunnel in the Jersey Turnpike traffic. Lots of traffic. And when I was finally free of it, I started to lose the New York station I'd been listening to. Me driving without listening to the radio is unheard of. A radio goes on and then the ignition. I flipped around for a minute or two, a lot of top 40s. Too many, I thought. Some guy from Charleston that had something, but no cigar. I left him for a sound out of Montreal. Well, nothing here. Let me try FM. I flipped it on, and that old Irish McMahon luck, there was Jack Pyle. Now, what in the world was he doing on FM? He was doing great. Great music as usual. That great Jack Pyle sound. Herman's heard. Pyle was doing one of those great setups for Apple Honey. I was home free. I cranked the volume up loud, turned on the back speaker, and as I tooled down that black macadam snake called the Garden State, I was a happy fella. There we were, the dear reflectors, that 15-cent cigar I bought in New York to keep me awake, Jack Pyle and me. Me, a regular pile driver. What was it, this Jack Pyle? That, that voice was a big part of it. Certainly that voice. Rumpled and wrinkled as though he'd slept in it. More than likely, he or it hadn't gotten much sleep at all. But it was more than that, much more. Something that he did with a microphone. Some special way he looked at a record. Jack Pyle was the kind of guy that when he got involved, he got involved. Three guys having drinks together became a party. He didn't just go to a ball game. He went away with the team for winter training. And he would have suited up and clouded a few out to Richie if he could have gotten away with it. Jack Pyle got involved with a microphone, too. He had a love affair with it. And when you listen, you always thought he was talking just to you and nobody else. When he said, hello, that housewife scrubbing pans in Maniac, that salesman late for a meeting in King of Prussia tooling up the expressway, the medic at the Navy Yard all wanted to say, hello, back. And I'll bet many of them did. They said of Gabriel Heater that he could look at a brick and see a house. Jack Pyle could look at a piece of acetate with a hole in it and see the Benny Goodman band on stage at the Earl Theater. Krupa, Hamp, James, Ziggy, Mo Pirtle, the countdown for stealing apples. Everything about him was like that. That suppressed chuckle, the borderline breakup, the overemphasis on the trivial that may have seemed unnecessary at first hearing became standard look-for sound, like when he introduced a colleague as the Baron of Berwick. Or, uh, I'll be back in about five minutes. My name is Jack Pyle. You have a real large weekend, will you? Well, that was just for me. Nobody else. Jack Pyle has left the studio now. There's a cigarette still burning in the ashtray. He forgot his raincoat. His office door is wide open, and you can see that disreputable desk. There are a couple of desk drawers open, too. And the key to the executive washroom... You'll find that in the lock where he left it. But I'll bet they find some records missing. The great Ed McMahon, as Jack would say. A gentleman that Jack knew well and who knew Jack well is next. Bill Gibbons. 
W-H-A-N in Rochester. Bill? Well, what do you say? What can you say? You know the words just won't come. Only the memories. And they're such good ones. They're warm and real. And Jack seems very close. And you know, in spite of that lump in my throat and quite unashamedly a film of honest tears, <laughs> I have to chuckle once in a while. Not out of disrespect, but in remembrance of the good times, the fun times, the laugh-filled times. And didn't we have them? I think I know how President Lincoln must have felt uh, when under similar mixed emotions. He was moved to comment so beautifully and so accurately. It hurts too much to laugh, and I'm too old to cry. The words are coming hard tonight. The memories, though, are recalled quite easily. Of all the people from whom you will hear tonight, I think I can safely say that I've known Jack the longest. See, I still can't bring myself to refer to him in the past tense. I remember just as though it were yesterday the night Carol was born, 19 years ago. And Jack and I were together then in Charleston, South Carolina. Or that sunny Sunday afternoon in Brooklyn 16 years ago. Jack and I were there that eventful day the Phillies won the pennant. Rob, Don Newcomb, Richie Ashburn, Dick Sisler. But golly, you remember that one as well as I do. I remember, too, Jack's genuine affection for Gene Graves, for Paul Taylor, Vince Lee, and John Franklin, our old KY crew. His fondness and admiration for Eddie Sawyer, for Babe Alexander, Frank Powell, Bob Beck, Bill Mowbray, Harry Foster, and, of course, Robin Roberts. I remember the time we talked Ray Hartenstein into bringing Louie to Sunnybrook. I remember our first big band tribute. Jack always thought it was the first Saturday in April 1954 that we started that. Actually, it was October 23rd, 1953 on KYW. Our first tribute to Glenn Miller and... <laughs> You know, I'm still freeloading on them to this day. We're doing them now in Rochester, WHAM, some 13 years later. I can remember Toby, age five, pitching to Philadelphia Athletics coach Chief Bender at Connie Mack Stadium on the occasion of KYW baseball night. That was in 1951. I remember the last time we talked. It was only four days before he died. And this wonderful, unpredictable, outgoing character that he is, was, was true to form right to the last. <laughs> he called me at 20 minutes to 3 in the morning. Any tribute or remembrance of Jack Pyle, during which we dwell on the big bands and the tributes, just wouldn't be complete without a word from this guy. He made a lot of it all possible. Without his fabulous record collection and unstinting loyalty and cooperation, Jack and I probably wouldn't have made it past the third show instead of the 15 or so that we did present. A man whose friendship Jack Pyle always prized very highly, as I still do to this day. Here's Harry Foster. Thanks, Bill. It's unfortunate that we get together under such sad circumstances especially since you, Bill, were the one who first introduced me to Jack back in 1954 when you were both at KYW and Jack had started the first big band tributes. I remember very vividly sitting in Bill Givens' living room with Jack and setting up the first tribute to Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Orchestra. As to Jack, much, much could be said and has been said, I know, on this program. But... From my point of view, I know he loved life and enjoyed every moment of it, no matter what he was doing or how things went. I seem to notice he was an inspiration to those around him in the way in which he could approach and even pass around adversity or a disappointing circumstance. And uh, I've often felt, and still do, and would like to pass on to you the fact that if one could get as much joy from living as Jack did, and we all know how much he did, 
that he or she would never worry about their circumstances or success or their lack of it. Jack is gone now. You've lost a loyal, dedicated performer who has been very much a part of your way of life every day for over the past 16 years. And I've lost a very close and very dear friend. Let me say simply, but with all the sincerity at my command, that you and I, all of us who came in touch with this warm personality in any way are much richer tonight and my own personal memories and experiences much fuller much brighter but i'm missing very much jack Pyle died wednesday april 27th 1966 but i don't have to believe it if i don't want to thank you bill Givens, for being part of us tonight I'm John Trent, and uh, I'm glad to join in in this tribute to a friend of so many of ours, Jack Pyle. By this time, you have run down a whole list of people who are celebrated here and in various other places who were part of the whole scene that uh, Jack inhabited. And we have some more for you to meet during this next hour. Here, one of his friends and a close friend, and the singer he loved and admired, Ella Fitzgerald. Jack Pyle, a wonderful disc jockey, a friend. To me, he was always a friend, not just uh, someone who broadcast their program. He would be deeply missed. And he was a type of man that believed in what he believed in, music-wise, good music. And, and I recall a time when he said, that uh, I made a little rock and roll number, and he said, I love you, but I'm not going to play that junk coming from you. And it was the kind of friend that told you the truth and meant what he said. He will be deeply missed not only by me, but by all of the people who love good music. And we just sympathy go to his wife, who has been such a wonderful person also. It was a nice tribute to Jack and heartfelt. And now, another old friend of the man's. And uh, this is a fellow who preceded Jack at WPBS here. Jack's uh, main function here was uh, being the morning man from 6 to 9, Monday through Friday. But there's uh, Harry Kay. Harry? I'm certain that uh, anyone who knew Jack Pyle must have an anecdote of some sort that uh, he recalls when he takes a moment to look back on time spent with Jack. I remember one that comes back from a night oh, seven or eight years ago. The uh, night was far spent. <laughs> Jack was always a bit profligate with time when the scene was right and the company and refreshment matched his mood. We were discussing singers and uh, although Ella was of course the top of the line with Jack he uh, appeared to be respectfully interested in my salutation to Kirsten Flagstein. I wasn't putting Ella down, you understand, just uh, in the heat of my enthusiasm and heightened by the spirits of the moment. I was urging him to find, perhaps, a greater fulfillment. Well, finally, after running out of steam, I... Uh, pause to refill my glass and estimate the effect I'd had on Pyle. As I passed him the bottle, he said, you know, I guess you figure the same way about Flankstad as I do about Ella. If I remember clearly, the conversation moved into other channels after that. But I've often thought of that reply. I think it pegged Jack pretty well. Here's Dan Curtis. Thank you, John. What's the line? Uh, we continue with the, with the good sounds. And uh, on this particular night, got the lump, too. Wouldn't that be another line? I could go from now till midnight with stories, but I won't. One that I do have to tell you, maybe you remember when Jack was reading the poetry. And he's gone now, but... 
I think he'd think a little less of me if I told you now that I loved the poetry when, while he was around, I said I couldn't stand it. <laughs> but uh, I'd go in the studio while Jack was reading a particularly sentimental poem and try pretty hard to make him laugh, and it just wouldn't work. He wouldn't laugh. A wonderful guy, a guy, uh, a guy who was an advocate of a golden era who absolutely refused to compromise what he thought were great musical standards, and I think I have to go along with him. Because the music world fell apart, Pyle made up his mind he wasn't going to fall apart with it. And I'll be very frank to say there are probably lots of us who compromised our musical standards, you know, with a mortgage, for other reasons. This man never did. One of Jack's uh, unpaid producers has a love of music and to keep himself uh, in food and home, he's a traffic cop on the Walt Whitman Bridge. The, uh, what did Pyle call him? The pride of Tuckerton, New Jersey. Love to have him say a word on this program, which is, of course, a tribute to Jack Pyle. An unpaid producer, here is Gordon Levine. Thank you, Dan. Jack was a character. But he was a lovable character. A man who stuck to his guns. A man that stuck with the big bands through thick and thin. Jack was not a phony. Jack was just a great guy. This is Dan Curtis, and uh, every time I hear a Glenn Miller record, or, well, you know the sounds, you got to think of the man. Let's hear now from Dave Wolford. I didn't know Jack Pyle as long as most of the people on the program tonight, but when we, when we did meet and subsequently worked together, I think we did get to know each other very well. Jack was the kind of man you got to know well, because he gave very much of himself. He didn't hold any punches. I certainly can't say anything about Jack that hasn't been said by others except this one thing. Without any exaggeration, Jack Pyle was my best friend. He went far out of his way to help me many times, and especially one time when I needed, I needed help like I had never needed it before. And I think I can say, along with a lot of other people, that he was still helping me the day he died. For those of us who spent any time around Jack at all, it's, it's difficult to even talk without using some of his favorite expressions. Things like, how's everything where you are? It's time to make the move, he used to say. And the one thing that never did make any sense but seemed so right all the same was the way he'd say, who does your laundry? And I expect in all the world there's no one who sounds quite the same as Jack did when he said, hello. At WPBS, there's a fellow behind the scenes here who has a rather unique distinction. He worked with Jack at another station where Jack worked and came to be a close friend of Jack Pyle's. He's a producer, a record librarian, a general man of all capabilities, and a good friend of Jack Pyle's, Skip Clayton. Thank you, Dave. As you may know, Jack and I were very close to each other. He did so many things for me, patiently teaching me things I didn't know. Now I can only look back to remember the many hours we worked together and how enjoyable and wonderful they were, and there were many. I will always remember that any time we played a Tommy Dorsey or a Benny Goodman number that had a Bunny Berrigan solo or a record by Bunny's band, when we got the Bunny solo, I would turn up the volume in the studio, and then I would watch Jack imitate Bunny. There was a place in Philadelphia that Jack liked to go, just to sit down and listen to the music. It's run by a band man that Jack liked a lot to be around, a man he just liked. Here's Jack's friend, Billy Kretschmer. Thank you, Dave. Well, about Jack Pyle. You know, he had a great faculty for intenseness. He liked things so intensely. I remember when he used to walk into the club and we'd be playing. Maybe our audience wasn't as responsive as it should be. But the very, the very presence of Jack Pyle, the way he permeated this enthusiasm, when all of a sudden the whole room used to rock. It was this great love he had. And, of course, he did that in other things. And I'll never forget the wonderful, wonderful sessions at Jack's house. These went on to the wee, wee hours. The happy things of Jack Pyle. Well, 46 years, but he sure did crowd him in. And some great, great times. Of course, my 
experiences uh, with Jack are limited, possibly, to music and, and uh, fun. And things like our trip to Florida, where we played on the train. These things I'll never forget. And uh, the people with it were along. Well, just, well, the guy that spurred this thing on with his, as I said, enthousi enthusiasm and his great love, Jack Pyle. One of the guys that go down forever. It's a big, big loss to me. I shall never forget. Here's another enthusiast of the big band sound, a fellow that Jack worked with, an associate of Jack for many years. Our friend, too, Pat Landon. Thanks, Dave. Uh, under the circumstances, it's uh, something rather difficult to have to do, having known our good friend for some time. A uh, fellow compatriot and occasionally a ne'er-do-well, my favorite term for him was mumbles, and uh, I can well imagine what he might have said back as he did so many times. Uh, at this hour in the evening, I'm pretty sure you've been listening for the last, what, three and a half or more and I do believe there are not uh, very many dry eyes in the area at this particular point, yours truly included. Of course, uh, he was always strong for the big bands, as you well know, and yours truly likewise, plus vocal groups if they sang in harmony or in tune, I might say. Uh, that's my little touch of appreciation and remembrance, so far as our friend is concerned. Another gentleman who has perhaps uh, other kinds of memories is right here with us this evening. General Manager, WPBS... Ed Meehan. Ed? Thank you, Pat. What more can you say? There's been so many wonderful things said about such a wonderful guy. And there's so little that can be added except that each individual experience you had with the guy means individually so much to each of us. I've had my share of anecdotes with Jack uh, for many years. I've been a fan of his, a friend, and the last several years, his boss. And... Uh, you have an awful lot of wonderfully common experiences when you get into a relationship such as those with uh, such a tremendous guy as Jack. It's tough to come to the end of something like this. I guess it never comes to the end, really, because what Jack said and what Jack did will go on not just today, but for years and years ahead. Every time we think of the guy, we're going to have a little twinkle, a little sparkle, a little smile, because there were so many wonderful things that he shared with you and with me and with all of us, I think, both individually and collectively, both in front of the microphone and away from it. For a little while tonight, once again, a giant has walked among us. And from those of his friends who have shared with us on, once again, both sides of the microphone, the the wonderful experiences, the anecdotes, the music, and the personality of Jack Pyle. We, all of us, most respectfully, most humbly dedicate to Jack's memory these last four hours. <laughs> 